This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. Welcome to the Humanist Report podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is the 69th episode of the podcast. Today is November 18th, and before we get started, we have several new people to thank for deciding to join the independent progressive media revolution. Today we have Robert Kuzma who sent in a donation with a message comparing me to Tom Hartman. That is incredibly flattering. Thank you so much. Uh, We also want to thank Otis Richardson, Maggie Battles, Miguel Isaza, Harris Sefik, Philip Kukulski, Lawrence G., Charles Morgan, and Alex Baker. So all of these people either decided to become Patreon patrons, uh, become members on HumanistReport.com, or send us a donation via PayPal. So if you would like to join the independent progressive media revolution as well, you could visit the links down below in the description box, or you could simply support the show by liking and sharing our videos, or by using our Amazon link to shop, or if you want to, you can whitelist us on Adblock. So on today's episode, the blame game continues, and in this round, we'll look at arguments as to why Bernie Sanders, third-party voters, and FBI Director James Comey are to blame for Trump's victory. Also, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are stepping up and filling in leadership roles at the Democratic Party. I'll tell you if this is actual change or just the veneer of change. I'll talk about Trump's cabinet, Mike Pence's hypocrisy, and Trump's consideration of a literal World War II-era fascist policy. So all of these topics and more will be discussed in today's episode. Hopefully you enjoy the program. So we know that Hillary Clinton's closest aides are blaming her defeat to a buffoon like Donald Trump on everything but themselves and their flawed candidate. They're blaming sexism. They're blaming Bernie Sanders, James Comey, the media, which is all just ridiculous. So we finally are hearing now from the horse's mouth who's to blame. Why does Hillary Clinton think she was defeated by Donald Trump? Is it because she ran a divisive campaign and split the base? Well, of course not. She's not going to take responsibility. She's not going to admit that she was wrong. And this is what happens when you surround yourself around yes men. So why does Hillary Clinton think she lost? Well, the New York Times explains Hillary Clinton on Saturday cast blame for her surprise election loss on the announcement by the FBI director James Comey days before the election that he had revived the inquiry into her use of a private email server. In her most extensive remarks since she conceded the race to Donald Trump early Wednesday, Mrs. Clinton told donors on a 30-minute conference call that Mr. Comey's decision to send a letter to Congress about the inquiry 11 days before the election day had thrust the controversy back into the news and had prevented her from ending the campaign with an optimistic closing argument. There are lots of reasons why an election like this is not successful, Mrs. Clinton said, according to a donor who relayed the remarks. But, she added, our analysis is that Comey's letter raising doubts that were groundless, baseless, proven to be stopped our momentum. Still, Mrs. Clinton's instinct to shun any personal responsibility angered some Democrats. Several donors on the call, while deeply bitter about Mr. Comey's actions, said they believed that Mrs. Clinton and her campaign had suffered avoidable missteps that handed the election to an unelectable opponent. They pointed to the campaign's lack of a compelling message for white working class voters and to decisions years ago by Mrs. Clinton to use a private email address at the State Department and to accept millions of dollars for speeches to Wall Street. On Friday night, Mrs. Clinton thanked volunteers on a nationwide conference call and she said, look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, she said, sighing. These have been very, very tough days. As I can imagine, yes, this is a very difficult time for you, but this is why it's imperative that Hillary Clinton and the Democrats realize why she lost. If they don't get their act together, then not only will they not take back the Senate in 2018, but they're going to lose to Donald Trump again. And people who are progressive were screaming the loudest, don't play with fire, don't risk putting up a flawed candidate against Donald Trump. We saw how he wrecked 16 other opponents in the Republican primary. Please, don't risk it. Put forth a strong progressive like Bernie Sanders who is galvanizing millennials and encouraging millions of new people to register to vote and you will win this. But you are not listening to us and you're not looking in the mirror and reflecting as to why you lost. Hillary Clinton, I shouldn't have to remind you of why you lost and it should be very evident. 
you chose a corporatist as your VP pick. You chose a centrist corporatist Democrat who is backed by Wall Street. Tim Kaine, nobody wanted him. You could have tried to unify the base again with Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, but you didn't even think about it. Now, also, you split the base by running a divisive campaign and you didn't do anything to try to reunify the base. You helped spread the narrative that Bernie Sanders supporters were sexist, that Bernie Sanders was racist. And all this time, when you slandered Bernie Sanders, you and your surrogates like David Brock claimed that you know, Bernie Sanders, he's just running such a dirty campaign. He's poisoning the minds of millennials. Factually incorrect. You can go back and check all of my older videos where I talk about the attacks that you were waging against Bernie Sanders and how disingenuous they were and how you should be ashamed of yourself for it. And you pissed off a lot of progressives and Bernie Sanders supporters. And you just were cocky and arrogant. You thought that because your supporters supported Obama in 2008 after you conceded the race to him that we would do the same. But we warned you, progressives are not sheep. Millennials are a voting block that typically tend to stay home if they're not inspired by a candidate and you didn't listen. Instead, you were so confident that you had our votes on lock that you decided to court neoconservatives and Republicans. Did you honestly think that you could make up the votes that you lost during the primaries by courting neoconservatives and Republicans? You know, this is just so frustrating. I feel as though when I hear this and I hear their failure to not take responsibility, it signals to us that we're never going to get changed because if Democrats don't actually listen to their voting base and they don't look in the mirror and see that they failed us and that they became too corporatist that's why they lost then we may have donald trump for eight years as opposed to just four and i don't want that to happen donald trump is already proving to be a disaster so we're telling you democrats please listen to us we don't want donald trump to be our president but voters are not going to be encouraged to come out and vote for you if you don't get your act together so this is incredibly disappointing that Hillary Clinton would have the audacity to blame James Comey when he cleared her days before the election. Nobody thought that he would do that, but he cleared her. So you can't blame James Comey, Hillary Clinton. You just can't. You know, there's the phrase live and learn, right? But sometimes you just never learn. Sometimes you never learn your lesson. Even facing a crushing defeat against an orange clown like Donald Trump does not teach you your lesson because your head is so far up your ass that you will never learn. So mainstream media outlets are desperately trying to figure out why the hell it's the case that Hillary Clinton lost to a despicable candidate like Donald Trump. Now, they're still playing the blame game, and it's very clear that we have to blame Democratic incompetency for failing to get out the vote and inspire their base to turn out and vote. But they're blaming all the wrong people, and MSNBC has a new theory as to who we should blame. Third-party voters. So they argue it's hard not to notice the importance of third-party voters and the impact they had on the outcome. In Florida, Hillary Clinton lost by about 1.4% of the vote, but if Jill Stein's supporters and half of Gary Johnson's backers had voted Democratic, Trump would have lost the state. Similarly, in Pennsylvania, Clinton lost by about 1.1% of the vote, but if Jill Stein's supporters and half of Gary Johnson's backers had voted Democratic, Trump would have lost the state. In Wisconsin, Clinton lost by about 1% of the vote, but if Stein's supporters had voted Democratic, Trump would have lost the state. In Michigan, Clinton appears to be on track to lose by about 0.3% of the vote, but if half of Stein supporters had voted Democratic, Trump would have lost the state. And also, another hypothetical situation we didn't consider is what if 100% of Donald Trump's voters voted for Hillary Clinton? Then Hillary Clinton, she probably would have won all 50 states. So, <laughs> I mean, this, this is ridiculous, and this is cognitive dissonance by the mainstream media and furthermore we know that msnbc is the propaganda wing of the democratic establishment so they have a vested interest in trying to demonize anyone that deviates from their party so if you vote for a third party candidate you're you're doing a bad thing that's what they want you to believe but look we all knew that this was going to happen so we were prepared for it and thankfully the math isn't on their side this time so the wall street journal as much as i criticize them 
They actually crunched the numbers, and they concluded that the third-party vote doesn't appear to have been the key factor in Democrat Hillary Clinton's defeat at the hands of Republican Donald Trump last week. So when you look at some of the key states here and examine just the top row for a second, you'll see that Donald Trump's margin of victory was fairly narrow in these states. And even though votes for Stein and Johnson combined exceeds Donald Trump's margin of victory, here's how it would have went for Hillary Clinton in alternate hypothetical scenarios. So if Hillary Clinton would have captured 60% of the total third party vote, Trump still would have won. If she would have got 65%, Donald Trump still would have won. Now, if she would have been able to capture 70% of the third party vote, which would assume that third party voters take very little votes away from Trump, then she would have won. And this is just an absurd scenario to assume that all third party voters are taking votes away from Hillary Clinton. Now, if 100% of Jill Stein's votes and half of Gary Johnson's vote went to Clinton, she still would have lost. Finally, Clinton would have had to capture 100% of Stein's support and 60% of Johnson's vote to win. So this scenario in general is just preposterous seeing that Gary Johnson is a conservative candidate. Most likely he would have taken a substantial portion of votes away from Donald Trump. And I don't like how we all just assume that third party voters would have supported Hillary Clinton had the third party option not existed. They probably just would have stayed home. And there are many indications for this because when you look at voter turnout in 2008, 2012, and 2016, you'll see that Hillary Clinton actually got about 10 million less votes than Obama did in 2008 and about 5 million less than he did in 2012. Now, there were signs of this during the primaries because when turnout was low during the primaries, Hillary Clinton tended to win big. And Hillary Clinton really really needed to keep turnout low during the primary so she could win the primary. And the DNC actually didn't even do their usual get out the vote campaigns during the primaries at the behest of Hillary Clinton because they didn't want to help Bernie Sanders. And that bit them in the ass hard. So again, we have to acknowledge a stone cold fact. If Jill Stein did not exist, those voters probably would have just stayed home. If Gary Johnson did not exist, those voters probably would have just stayed home and many would have probably voted for Donald Trump, seeing that ideologically Gary Johnson and his libertarian views are more similar to Donald Trump's libertarian economic views. So it's just absurd to claim that third party voters cost Hillary Clinton the election. And furthermore, if these third party voters didn't get out to vote, then we could have seen bigger losses for Democrats in the House and the Senate. So don't try to berate third party voters and shame them for not supporting the candidate of your choice because in a way they probably helped the Democratic Party overall. And when we have turnout that's so low in this country, I don't think shaming voters is a very smart tactic, especially when low turnout hurts Democrats and helps Republicans. And let me just say something that may be controversial here. Uh, we live in a democracy. We live in a democratic republic where we elect politicians to represent us. It's the politicians that represent us. We don't have to represent the politicians. So even if it's the case that you could quantifiably prove that Hillary Clinton lost specifically due to third party voters, doesn't matter. If Hillary Clinton was unsuccessful at making up more voters, and if the Democratic Party was unsuccessful at registering new voters to account for the voters that she's losing to Gary Johnson and Jill Stein, you don't blame third party voters for that. You blame the Democratic establishment for failing us and selling out and choosing to try to combine the interests of Wall Street and the working class when that's a disaster of a strategy. It didn't work for you. And to try to blame third party voters is problematic because if you really want to win again, if you want to try to take back the Senate in 2018 to prevent Trump from passing through his fascist policies, then actually take heed to our advice because we were right this election. You were wrong. Be progressive and you'll win. Run progressive candidates and you'll win. Period. Stop trying to blame third party voters. Recognize that you were wrong. 
So at this point, everyone and their mother and their cousin and their uncle and their dog has been blamed for Hillary Clinton's shocking defeat to Donald Trump. Now, everyone except Hillary Clinton probably has been blamed for her defeat. So one argument, however, is so ridiculous, published in Time magazine, where they try to scapegoat Bernie Sanders for Hillary Clinton's loss, and they refer to him as the Ralph Nader of 2016. So the title alone is infuriating because Ralph Nader did not cost Al Gore the election in 2000. Al Gore ran a shitty, uninspiring campaign, and more Democrats voted Republican than they voted Green in 2000. It's an inconvenient fact, but let's hear them out. What do they have to say as to why Bernie Sanders cost Hillary Clinton the election? Well, they state, on election day, Senator Bernie Sanders earned the 2016 Ralph Nader Award for the leftist most responsible for helping Republicans win the presidency. True, Donald Trump cleverly exploited voters' frustrations, and Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016 was as rigid and empty as it was when she lost in 2008. Still... Sanders helped Clinton lose. His insurgency pushed her too far left to prevent an effective recentering in the fall, while goading her into wooing different constituencies rather than uniting the nation. In fairness, Sanders ran a surprisingly effective campaign, tapping the anti-establishment fury Donald Trump stirred. Although Sanders and Trump are very different, their campaigns were not. Each treated Hillary Clinton as a compromised, Wall Street-worshipping, establishment sellout, because she was. Both demonized Washington insiders and free trade, rather than tackling the real structural problem. The United States deindustrialized because Americans refused to pay what it cost to hire American workers, and instead buy cheaper imported products. As a result, just as Ralph Nader siphoned tens of thousands of votes on Election Day 2000 in Florida from Al Gore, Causing the deadlock and George W. Bush's victory, Bernie Sanders' similar vampire effect enfeebled Hillary Clinton. Pressed by the Sanders sensation, intimidated by Black Lives Matter, even Bill Clinton backpedaled, apologizing for fighting crime and his centrist legacy, with no one explaining how bad crime was in the 1990s, how dysfunctional the welfare system was, how two-thirds of blacks supported both initiatives. Clinton's legislation seemed draconian. Hillary Clinton became a donut candidate sprinkling sweets to particular groups but lacking any core. That distortion made her the perfect foil for Donald Trump's demagoguery. Sanders liberals considered Clintonian centrism not liberal enough, not minority sensitive enough, not pure enough. The result is a president-elect hostile to liberalism, unafraid of demonizing minorities and epitomizing a killer instinct that makes Clintonian triangulation look naive. All this makes Bernie Sanders the nader of 2016. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, that is the most ridiculous argument I've seen thus far. Uh, and I've seen a lot of dumb arguments as to why Hillary Clinton lost, but this definitely takes the cake. And I like how you're living in your own deluded reality. You say that Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump each treated Hillary Clinton as a compromised, Wall Street-worshipping establishment sellout. Buddy. This wasn't just the way she was treated. This was factual. This isn't a hypothetical situation that they concocted. They looked at the facts. They looked at the Wall Street contributions that Hillary Clinton received. They looked at the speeches that she gave to Wall Street and refused to release the transcripts for. They looked at her policies. It's no secret. She is a Wall Street sellout. You're just denying reality. Combined, Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton have raised billions of dollars together. If that's not establishment to you, then what is? If Hillary Clinton is not an establishment candidate, then that word has zero meaning. Now, he also said that uh, Hillary Clinton was intimidated by Black Lives Matter. Yes, because these people who are terrified of the police who's supposed to be protecting them, how dare they try to pressure Hillary Clinton to take a strong stance on criminal justice reform? <laughs> I mean... This is so fresh this is so frustrating to hear so-called liberals make this argument. They're lucky that Black Lives Matter didn't protest Hillary Clinton more than they did Bernie Sanders at first. Now, uh, he actually lambasted Bill Clinton to a degree for backpedaling on his centrism. And he says nobody talks about how bad crime was in the 1990s or how dysfunctional the welfare system was. Do you not realize what Bill Clinton did to welfare? He didn't reform welfare in a way that benefits welfare recipients. He effectively gutted welfare. And yes, he kind of put up a fight. He vetoed the bill twice before inevitably signing it. But he still signed Republican welfare into law. You don't run out of vetoes. 
Okay, uh, yes, it is the case that Congress can override a president's veto, but that's not what happened. Bill Clinton signed a bill into law that made it more difficult for single mothers, particularly African American and Latinos, to get welfare. That's just wrong. And yes, it is the case that crime was bad in the 1990s, but there were people that were speaking out against the crime bill saying, look, this is not the correct way to tackle crime. You're going to just create a mass incarceration prison industrial complex that screws up the country, that inevitably creates more problems, that increases the rate of, rec of recidivism. So everything that I get from this article is that you are creating this false reality and you're choosing to live in it rather than face the facts. Look, the fact of the matter is that Bernie Sanders did not cost Hillary Clinton the election. He campaigned his ass off for her when he didn't have to do that. He campaigned his ass off for her after the DNC tried to rig the primary and they successfully did that against him. Unbelievable. To blame Bernie Sanders is just disgusting, and I'm ashamed that Time would even publish this garbage. So after their embarrassing defeat to Donald Trump, Democrats had a leadership shakeup. Now the true question is, did they learn their lesson? Not so much. So The Atlantic explains the two popular liberals will be part of the Senate Democratic leadership in the 115th Congress that begins in January. Warren will be a vice chairwoman of the conference while Sanders will serve as chairman of outreach. The moves were announced after Democrats unanimously elected Senator Charles Schumer of New York to be their next leader, replacing retiring Senator Harry Reid of Nevada. Schumer's election had been expected for months, and he will be followed in the pecking order by Senators Richard Durbin of Illinois and Patty Murray of Washington, who have each served in the leadership with Schumer for years. Warren had also been given a lower-ranking leadership post in the last Congress, although Sanders had not. In an effort to maintain Democratic unity, Schumer cast a wide net in forming an ever-growing leadership team. In addition to Sanders and Warren, more centrist senators Mark Warner of Virginia and Joe Manchin of West Virginia will also have senior roles. Sanders will serve as the top Democrat on the Budget Committee as well, and in a key change that could impact the confirmation of Trump's nominees for the Supreme Court, Senator Dianne Feinstein of California will replace Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont as the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee. Leahy is leaving to take the top slot on the even more influential Appropriations Committee. So, is Chuck Schumer the correct choice for a Senate Minority Leader? Absolutely not. Uh, he is the male equivalent of Hillary Clinton, and if anything, he's even more politically conservative than Hillary Clinton because Hillary Clinton was at least in support of the Iranian peace deal, which prevents them from getting nuclear weapons rather than just outright going to war with them. He was against that. Hillary Clinton supported that. So if anything, you could make the case that Chuck Schumer is more conservative than Hillary Clinton, and he also voted for the Iraq War and the Patriot Act. So... This is a terrible decision. You're putting another Wall Street shill as head of the Democratic Party. And the fact that Democrats voted unanimously for it is just embarrassing and shows that they have no clue what they're doing. And I'm ashamed that even Bernie Sanders voted for him. Now, I get it. Bernie Sanders doesn't want to register as a Democrat. He wants to remain an independent, so he doesn't have that much leverage. But if Democrats want to win, if they want to take back the Senate in 2018... You've got to shake it up. Now, when they say that, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders were given these positions of leadership, you know, I give them credit where credit is due. Is this a step in the right direction? Sure. But to me, what this really does is give us the veneer of change. So they're just showing us, yeah, you know, we're trotting out Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. You know, we're going to take their advice. But in actuality, we're not going to do any real substantive change because we still want to be financed by our large donors and we are too afraid to abandon them. Well, you're going to lose again. If you keep going this route, you are going to lose again and again and again. And you're going to give us Trump again in 2020. Look, you have to stop being a corporate shill of a party. You actually have to represent the working class. They didn't turn out for you in the election because you abandoned them. And if you honestly think that you're still going to be the party of Wall Street and get your voters to come back to you, I've got bad news for you. It's not going to happen. So who should have been the Senate minority leader for the Democrats? Well, I don't care if Bernie Sanders is still an independent. It should have been Bernie Sanders, hands down. 
There's no other more liberal senator in the country than Bernie Sanders. There's no one that has the capacity to reshape the Democratic Party than Bernie Sanders. And I've had my differences with Elizabeth Warren, but again, you're not really giving her a strong leadership position. I mean, we need to clean house. With how embarrassing your defeat was, we have to clean house. Chuck Schumer should have withdrawn from this bid to be Senate Minority Leader. He should have just said, look, I, I get it, but for the good of the country and the party, I'm going to step down and allow someone new to become the leader of the Democratic Party. But he chose to be selfish, and he's going to get in there and put the needs of his donors above all of the voters in the base. So when you do that, you're going to lose, and you're going to be responsible for President Trump again when he inevitably wins re-election because of your incompetence. And what's the most frustrating thing is that this should be easy. Republicans are a minority party, and yet they have complete control because of your incompetence. This is just unacceptable. And many people say, Mike, why do we even care about the Democratic Party? It's a lost cause. And I get it. I get it. I understand Dem Exit. I created Dump Dems Day for a reason. I'm so frustrated. But the problem is that we have to have dual goals. We have to build up the Green Party or create a new party. Uh, but we also have to reform the Democratic Party because currently... When it comes to third parties, our electoral system literally rigs it against third and fourth parties. So if we really want progressive policies to get through, we have to do everything we can to reform the Democratic Party. But just know that we're still trying to build up the Green Party. So if they don't pay attention, they're going to continue to lose voters to third and fourth parties. So uh, look, the conclusion is that Democrats, they're never going to learn. And at this point, it just seems like a lost cause. When are they going to get their shit together? When are they going to listen to progressives? They'll never realize that centrism doesn't work. You ran a centrist candidate and she failed. She failed to someone who should have been a cakewalk. Learn your lesson. Step aside, allow Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren to actually help remake the party in their image if you ever want to have a chance of winning again. In a recent meeting between the Democratic Party establishment and its wealthy donors such as George Soros, Elizabeth Warren attended it, which I don't know why she attended it, but nonetheless, at this meeting, we got to see a glimpse of the Elizabeth Warren that we all knew and loved since she was elected to the Senate. And in this meeting, she actually criticized the Democratic establishment and namely called out their centrism when it comes to Obamacare. So the Huffington Post explains the Massachusetts senator who walked into a standing ovation before she'd even been introduced told the bereft gathering that she was as capable as any other politician at defending Obamacare and rattled off its benefits. No more exclusions based on pre-existing conditions. You can stay on your parents plan until age 26, 20 million Americans covered, but let's be honest. It's not bold, it's not transformative, she added. Had the party acknowledged its shortcoming and pledged to fight for more, Warren said, that message may have resonated. I'm okay taking half a loaf if our message was, here's half, now let's go get the rest, she said. People who heard Warren's speech said it had a different feel than usual. It felt like she'd been rather further liberated. She made no particular effort to be quite as good a soldier, said one person in the room. It definitely seemed like a new era that she was able to really step out more than she'd been able to. Speaking at the gathering of the Democracy Alliance, she also highlighted Democrats' inability to help homeowners during the financial crisis, even though banks were bailed out. She blasted the failure to prosecute the bankers, saying that it suggested to working people just whose side the party was on. She also picked up on corporate-friendly trade policies, arguing Democrats were too eager to push deals that hurt the working class. That's where we failed, not in our messaging, but in our ideology, she said, according to the people in the room. When it came to the 2009 stimulus, she said, Democrats were too quick to compromise with Republicans, who opposed it nearly unanimously unanimously and then did little to put their stamp on it. Can anybody name one thing that's in the stimulus, she asked? Warren argued that Democrats need to ask who they truly are and who they stand for. Donald Trump had one message. I am with you, she said. This is the Elizabeth Warren that went away during the primaries. The Elizabeth Warren that we saw during the primaries, well, it looked like her soul had been crushed because she sold out and she sold her soul to the devil. She decided to step aside and allow establishment Democrats to steamroll progressives 
And she didn't stand up for Bernie Sanders, a true progressive during the primary. And I've been extremely critical of Elizabeth Warren. She just earned a few points back in my book. Now, is she complete and utterly redeemed at this point? No, she's not. Would I still support her in 2020 if she decided to run? Yes, I would. But she has a lot of making up to do. I I want to see this Elizabeth Warren more. I want to see this level of introspection because... Democrats know that if they want to win, they have to change it up. Elizabeth Warren, she's kind of a bridge now between the establishment and progressives. Look, she was a cheerleader for Hillary Clinton during the general, and that was disgusting for progressives to see. But I think that she has their ear now because she did fall in line. And I don't think she's going to fall in line again. I certainly hope she doesn't. But I do want to see more from Elizabeth Warren like this. I'm not willing to declare the return of Elizabeth Warren, right? Because... She still has a lot of work to do. She has to speak out on Dapple. She has to speak out on Black Lives Matter more frequently. And she has done this before. But I want her to really speak out on the progressive issues that we all care about. So here's what I want from Elizabeth Warren. I want her to continue this trend because if anyone could remake the party, it's her. Because unlike Bernie Sanders, they can't accuse her of not being a true Democrat, which is a stupid argument. But they can't accuse her of that because she is a Democrat. She's a registered Democrat, she votes Democrat, she is a member of the Democratic Party, and now she's in a leadership role, albeit a shitty one, but she's still in a leadership role. But if they want to win, take her advice, because everything she said here is spot on. Democrats sell out, they're too centrist. They showed working people that they don't give a damn about us, and this is what they needed to hear. And I like that, you know, when I first heard that she was at a meeting with George Soros, I was face palming because I'm like, Elizabeth Warren, really? Is this what you need to be doing now? Really? But she gave them a reality check. And if you're going to attend these private meetings and call them out, more power to you. I'm not going to fault you for that. So I say kudos to Elizabeth Warren. Credit where credit is due. I've been frustrated with you throughout the process of this election, but now it's time for you to regain your trust. And this is a good step in that direction. So during his campaign, Donald Trump assured us that, you know, the fact that he doesn't have any political or military experience doesn't really matter because he's going to surround himself around, quote, the smartest people. And if up is down and left is right, and by smartest people, he means the dumbest people in the country, then he is, in fact, surrounding himself around, quote, the smartest people. Because when you look at people who he might be tapping for cabinet positions, he is really going for the dumbest of what the alt-right has to offer. So just to give you a taste, according to Politico, he might tap Sarah Palin for interior secretary. Sarah Palin. Now, look, I don't know what Sarah Palin's IQ is, but if someone told me that she had the same IQ as a beetle, I would actually be surprised because I'm thinking it would be more closer to one of those flies who are attracted to lights and they just keep flying into it and banging their heads into it over and over. That's kind of what I would compare Sarah Palin to in terms of intelligence and brightness. So the fact that she would be in the White House, in the executive branch, in one of the powerful, the most powerful positions in the country and perhaps the world is a terrifying thought, and everyone should be afraid of this. Wow, <laughs> I'm still shocked. And I'm really trying not to be a dick here, but I can't help myself because this is just too much. Now, that's not all. So Myron Ebel is his top EPA advisor, and he doesn't believe in climate change. And also, he literally believes that pesticides are not bad for you. This is the individual who is Trump's top EPA advisor currently. He is advising Trump on the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, now we need to change that to the EDA, the Environmental Destruction Agency, because that's what we're going to get with this idiot. So according to Mother Jones, Ebel directs the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. The group runs a website, safechemicalpolicy.org, that exists to downplay the health and ecological impacts of chemicals. He makes a living off of doing propaganda for the oil and gas industry and convincing people to ignore the overwhelming majority of climate scientists and just what's right in front of you. I mean, the fact that we have record highs every year in terms of our temperature. Ignore that. This guy is right. Now, is he qualified to say that climate change is a hoax? No, he's not. But nonetheless, uh, he is Trump's top EPA advisor. Also... Donald Trump is hoping to grant his children top security clearances, presumably so they can advise him 
on national security issues. I'm not kidding. So CBS News writes, the Trump team has asked the White House to explore the possibility of getting his children the top security clearances. Logistically, the children would need to be designated by the current White House as national security advisors to their father to receive top secret clearances. However, once Mr. Trump becomes president, he would be able to put in that request himself. So, Let's put aside the outrageous showing of nepotism here for a second and just consider the implications of this. Look, if you asked me if I should be a national security advisor to any president, even I would be intimidated by that job. And I have two political science degrees. Uh, I got my master's specifically with a focus on international relations and Middle East and North African politics and geopolitics. I'm currently a PhD student. If you asked me if I should be Donald Trump's national security advisor, I would be intimidated and I don't know that I would be up for the job. He's tapping his kids for this role just because they're his kids. They have zero qualifications. Uh, they don't have any expertise in international relations. Just the fact that uh, they are related to Donald Trump, they're getting this position. The implications of this are not just far-reaching, but they're going to be long-lasting. Now, the grand finale here, and perhaps the most outrageous decision, is that Donald Trump made Steve Bannon, former executive chairman of Breitbart News, which is the propaganda wing of the alt-right movement, his chief strategist. And let me just remind you now that Breitbart News is now as close to state-run media as we're going to get. That guy his chief strategist. Now, Steve Bannon is one of the most despicable people in the country. He is an anti-Semitic white nationalist asshole. Uh, he's an alleged domestic abuser, according to his ex-wife. He inquired about how many Jewish students attended a particular school because he didn't want his daughters, quote, going to school with Jews. And he suggested that there are too many Asian CEOs in Silicon Valley. He's just a bad person. Now, this guy is Donald Trump's chief strategist. Thankfully, Democrats are actually putting up a fight. And they're trying to get Donald Trump to denounce Steve Bannon and to ditch him. Now, 160 Democrats in the House have signed on to a statement saying Donald Trump needs to drop him. And uh, zero Republicans have got on board. So the Republican Party, just to show you how extreme they are, just to measure how crazy they are, they're okay with the white nationalists in the White House. This is the most brazen showing of stupidity we've ever seen. Donald Trump, certainly, uh, you know, we thought Bush was bad. I miss George W. Bush now. I miss George Bush. He was leagues ahead of Donald Trump in terms of intelligence. Donald Trump he, he just surely he takes the cake for the dumbest president in U.S. history, and he hasn't even officially taken office yet. He's been president-elect for a little more than a week. Dumbest president. Dumbest. <sighs> so this is the smartest people that Donald Trump is surrounding himself by. Sarah Palin, Myron Ebel, Steve Bannon, uh, his kids. Welcome to Trump's America, people. It's going to be a shit show. You are so dumb. You are really dumb, for real. So right now, with the election of Donald Trump, many liberals are complete and utterly terrified because we don't know really what to expect. Is he actually going to follow through with some of his more insane policies? We don't know. And conservatives are currently laughing at liberals because, well, you know, we're making comparisons to him and Hitler. We're saying that he's a quasi or a proto-fascist. Now they say, oh, well, you know, everyone who liberals and Democrats and progressives don't like, they just call Hitler or they call a fascist. They called Bush a fascist. They compared Mitt Romney to Hitler. Well, first and foremost, that's projection because any liberal who you don't like, you automatically just declare that they're socialist or communist, when I bet that you probably couldn't define that term if your life depended on it. And second of all, we're not calling Donald Trump a proto-fascist because we simply dislike him. We're basing that label on the policies that he's proposing because as of late, he's talking about reinstating a Bush-era policy that is not just unconstitutional, but it's borderline fascist. Fusion explains... 
President-elect Donald Trump is reportedly considering plans for a national registry of Muslims under his new administration. He said policy advisors would recommend reinstating the National Security Entry-Exit Registration System, a post-9-11 era program that was shuttered in 2011 after civil rights groups pointed out the registry opened the door for widespread racial profiling. Muslims already say they fear for their personal safety after Trump's election, and the registry to single them out for their religion would only make matters worse. Now, anticipating the response of conservatives, they'll say, well, Mike, Bush did this policy, so why isn't Bush technically a fascist as well? Well, I'll tell you. So what Bush did was tantamount to anti-Muslim bigotry, no doubt. But Donald Trump's vehemently anti-Muslim nationalistic rhetoric makes the revival of this policy a lot more scarier under him because he also wants to ban Muslims from entering and exiting the country. And additionally, his anti-Muslim rhetoric is empowering anti-Muslim bigots across the country. Just to give you a taste of the Trump effect, anti-Muslim incidents have gone up and are now the highest they've been since 9-11. So in 2001, there were 481 anti-Muslim events, according to the FBI. And in 2015, the year in which Donald Trump launched his campaign, there's been 257 anti-Islamic incidents. And it's not just Muslims. So hate crimes overall increased about 6.7% from 2014 to 2015. But that increase still left such incidents below what they were a decade earlier. Anti-black incidents rose by about 7.6% anti-Jewish incidents rose by about 9%, and incidents based on sexual orientation rose by about 3.5% during that time frame. Now, the reason why we have to oppose this vigorously is because bigotry is a very slippery slope. If you start with one anti-Muslim policy, it leads to another and another, and the problem could augment across the country. And we could see not just the federal government implementing these types of bigoted policies, but we see state and local municipalities doing the same thing like they did in World War II era Germany. And guess what? We all saw the story. We well, you know what happened there. Let's not do it again. Quote, Nazi leaders began to make good on their pledge to persecute German Jews soon after their assumption of power. During the first six years of Hitler's dictatorship from 1933 until the outbreak of war in 1939, Jews felt the effects of more than 400 decrees and regulations that restricted all aspects of their public and private lives. The government required Jews to identify themselves in ways that would permanently separate them from the rest of the population. In August of 1938, German authorities decreed that by January 1st of 1939, Jewish men and women bearing first names of non-Jewish origin had to add Israel and Sarah respectively to their given names. All Jews were obligated to carry identity cards that indicated their Jewish heritage, and in the autumn of 1938, all Jewish passports were stamped with an identifying letter J. So, needless to say, we cannot let this happen to America. No, this registry isn't the same thing currently, but again, it's a slippery slope and it could quickly lead to more and more anti-Muslim bigotry that is sanctioned by the federal government. Now, to anyone who is defending this policy, let me ask you this. When liberals propose a federal registry for people who own guns, if you're one of the people that freak out about that, which is not unconstitutional, but are supporting this, which is unconstitutional because it violates the First Amendment. You're not objective, you're biased, you're just a hateful asshole who wants to single out Muslims because you're afraid. Well, how about this? Stop being afraid. We have to stand up for Muslim American citizens. We have to stand up for groups that are disadvantaged. And look, I'm an atheist. I disagree with their religion. I don't believe in God. But I will be damned if I'm going to let my country turn into a fucking fascist state where we are singling out one group based on their religion. It's not acceptable and I'm not going to let it happen. And the fact that people are willing to stand by and even defend this is sickening to me. And look, to defend this policy, just to show you how egregious it is, a Trump surrogate literally brought up Japanese internment camps and cited that as precedent for this policy. Take a look. You heard the mayor's position, which is, you know, we just, we don't do that kind of thing. We don't create registries based on religion. Yeah, well, we have in the past. We've done it based on race. We've done it based on religion. We've done it based on region. And the fact is, he also brings it back as like a constitutionality issue. The problem is, is people outside this country are not protected of the same constitutional rights as we are in America. So you think it's a good idea and you don't care that this is some sort of a slippery slope where Muslims may get just lumped into some group where they get put on a registry and some, 
you know, some aggressive law enforcement actor in the future might abuse that list. No, absolutely. Look, there's always a case for abuse in this thing. But the fundamental problem here is we have a large faction. Look, look, being a part of the Muslim faith is not a bad thing. And there's plenty. There's, you know, 1.6 billion Muslims out there. Most of them are perfectly good people. But the fact is there is a small percentage of people that have chose to align with an extreme ideology within the faith, and they're doing harm. So we would like to keep tabs on it until we can figure out what's going on. Trump has said, look, it's a, it's a regional-based thing right now. If they're coming into our country, we need to know who they are, where they are, and, and what's going on. Because well, he's trying we need to, to stop. He's trying to stop immigration into the country uh, from countries where there are major terrorist issues and we, until we can figure out what, what's going on. But this seems like something else, which is if you're coming over, I mean, this is just, this is what I'm reading, okay? This is that, um, that, 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 again, the Kansas Secretary of State, Chris Kobach, who helped write the tough immigration laws in Arizona, said today that Trump's policy advisors are drafting, they're discussing drafting a proposal to reinstate a registry for immigrants from Muslim countries for immigrants from Muslim countries. Yeah, and, and perfect, we'll be perfectly honest, it is legal. They say it'll hold constitutional muster. I know the ACLU is going to challenge it, but I think it'll pass. And we've done it with Iran back uh, back a, a while ago. We did it during World War II with Japanese, which, you know, call it what you Come will. On. Maybe, maybe you're wrong. Not, but... You're not proposing we go back to the days of internment camps, I hope. No, no, no. I'm not proposing that at all, Megan. But what I am you know saying is that we need to protect that. America I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that gets people scared, Carl. Right. But it's, I'm just saying there is precedent for it. And I'm not saying I agree with it, but in this case, I absolutely believe you that a regional base... You can't be citing base... Japanese internment camps as precedent for anything the president-elect is going to do. Look, the president needs to protect America first. And if that means having people that are not protected under our Constitution have some sort of registry so we can understand until we can identify the true threat and where it's coming from, I support it. You, you get the protections once you come here. If you are seeing this, you need to fight back. We cannot let this happen. This is not just the brazenly unconstitutional policy. It's just wrong. It's unethical. And we cannot let this stand in the United States of America. We claim to be a free country. Well, we're not free if we let this go through. And we all have to fight and stand up for our Muslim brothers and sisters right now and oppose this vigorously. So if there's anything that I've made clear throughout my tenure as the host of The Humanist Report, it's that I don't like when public officials try to shirk transparency and get around FOIA requests and hide emails from the public. And this is where I agree with Republicans, even though they're wrong on everything, they were correct to call out Hillary Clinton. And in fact, current VP elect Mike Pence also called out Hillary Clinton, and he unequivocally condemned her use of a private email server and her lack of transparency. Here's what he said. The new emails that have been made public just in the last week uh, seem to make a, a direct connection uh, between favors done by State Department officials and major foreign donors to the Clinton Foundation. But uh, the American people have a right to know. Now, additionally, he told Chris Matthews on MSNBC, quote, I truly do believe, as Abe Lincoln said, give the people the facts and the republic will be saved. Give the people the facts and the republic will be saved. Now, it turns out that Mike Pence doesn't actually believe this because he has an email issue himself. So according to Law News, Indiana Governor and Vice President-elect Mike Pence is in the middle of a legal battle to keep the contents of an email sent to him exempt from being disclosed as public record. This comes as Pence spent months on the campaign trail railing against Hillary Clinton for failing to disclose all of her emails. The email was in connection to an immigration lawsuit brought by the state of Texas against the U.S. government. Pence joined in the suit and hired a local law firm. As a result, Indianapolis lawyer William Groth has been bringing a legal battle of his own to get information behind Pence's decision to hire outside attorneys for the case, Indy Star reported. I think joining the lawsuit without the attorney general and hiring that firm was a waste of taxpayer dollars and the people have the right to know how much of their money was spent, Groth said to Indy Star, despite state attorney general Greg Zola reportedly giving Pence the okay to join the case. Zoller's office did not respond to the newspaper's request for comment. While Pence's administration has produced 57 pages of documents in response to Groth's request, Groth argued in a court filing that they were heavily redacted. Additionally, a key email that Pence received from Texas Governor Greg Abbott's chief of staff, Daniel Hodge, was turned over but without an attached document. 
Pence's administration made the redacting decisions and argued that the email attached was attorney worked product, which is privileged and exempt from being turned over according to Indiana's Access to Public Records Act. The matter went to trial, and after roughly a year-long court battle, a judge ruled in Pence's favor. The court decided that they did not have the authority to make the decisions regarding the administration's redactions to public records. Now, Groth is appealing the case. I think government transparency is an important concern of anyone who lives in a democracy democracy, the governor cannot put himself above the law, he said. So let me just break it down. Mike Pence is a gigantic hypocrite. He constantly railed against Hillary Clinton. Why did you delete those emails? Aren't you going to show us what's in the emails? Don't the American people have a right to know? And yet he is trying to avoid transparency himself. So it's okay for me to do that and to get around FOIA requests and to not show the public the contents of specific emails, but when Hillary Clinton does it, that's not acceptable. So, I mean, you have this double standard that Republicans create for themselves, and at the same time, they criticize Democrats for doing it. Now, I have no love for the Democratic Party. I'm not a supporter of Hillary Clinton. I think we all know that. And let's be objective here. Hillary Clinton did, in fact, delete 33,000 emails, whereas this is just one email and a heavily redacted document. So this isn't necessarily the same thing if we're being 100% objective and fair to Mike Pence, but... The problem is that if you're going to claim that you care about government transparency, and in his own words, I'll read it back to you, I truly do believe, as Abe Lincoln said, give the people the facts and the republic will be saved. If you believe that, then put your money where your mouth is and release the attachment of that email and actually give us a document that's not heavily redacted. Now again... I have no defense for Hillary Clinton. I think her use of a private email server and deletion of 33,000 emails was unacceptable. It was unethical, and she did it specifically to hide her corruption. But Mike Pence, if you're going to say that you care about transparency, then actually be transparent. Don't criticize people for what you're doing. That makes you a gigantic hypocrite. But we already know that Donald Trump and Mike Pence, they are hypocrites. And I just want you to be consistent. I want people to be consistent. If you're going to make a claim that you care about transparency, then be transparent yourself. Don't be a hypocrite. But we can expect Mike Pence to do exactly what Hillary Clinton did. He's going to get in office and try to hide many emails and hide a lot from the public. So that way we don't find out about his corruption and Donald Trump's corruption and perhaps his gay hookups. Who knows? But I just think that it is hilarious that you have been criticizing Hillary Clinton for months about this, and then you're doing basically the same thing. Laughable. And will Republicans actually be objective and call him out? Well, of course they won't call him out, because even if Republicans happen to be right about an issue, when their side does it, then it's okay, or they're silent on it. Well, how about this? How about we all stop being partisan hacks, Democrats and Republicans alike, and we just hold all Republicans, regardless of their party affiliation, to the same standard? That's all I want. The American people have a right to know. As a member of the LGBT community, Donald Trump supporters have tried to reassure me time and again that I have nothing to be worried about. Donald Trump is an LGBT ally because there's proof. Here's a picture of him holding up a flag that says LGBTs for Trump. <laughs> cool. So, I mean, he held up a gay flag, guys, so I guess we have nothing to be worried about. Now, more importantly, in an interview with 60 Minutes, he said that he is, quote, fine with marriage equality and that it's settled law. And look, I'll give him credit where credit is due. He's certainly the most progressive on the issue of gay rights when it comes to any other Republican president. And I'm hoping that he can facilitate a leftward shift of the Republican Party on this issue and another area where I'm going to give Trump credit. He believes that transgender people should be allowed to use whatever bathroom they want. So I'm more than willing to commend Donald Trump for this because I think this is good. However, the problem is that uh, this doesn't make him pro-gay. And there's two very specific reasons for that. One is that he made the most anti-gay governor in the country his running mate. And two, it doesn't matter what Donald Trump's personal views are on the matter. What matters is the Supreme Court justices that he appoints because they are the ones that can overturn the landmark marriage equality ruling, thus giving states the ability to deny marriages to LGBT couples. So, yes, this is good that Donald Trump is in favor of gay marriage, or he's at least just ambivalent towards it, but 
He's not pro-gay. If you are going to appoint Supreme Court justices that will overturn my rights, you're, you're not pro-gay. I can't consider you an ally. Now, according to Pink News, one of those conservative judges is William H. Pryor Jr., who has in the past suggested that same-sex couples should be punished with jail for having sex in their own homes. The former Alabama attorney general upheld a law in 2003 in Texas which criminalizes consensual gay sex, comparing it to polygamy, incest, pedophilia, prostitution, and adultery arguing that LGBT people are not protected by the U.S. Constitution, Pryor said states should be able to criminally charge gay people for having sex. This court has never recognized a fundamental right to engage in sexual activity outside of monogamous heterosexual marriage, let alone to engage in homosexual sodomy, wrote Pryor. Such a right would be antithetical to the traditional relation of the family that is as old and fundamental as our entire civilization. He also defended straight people's right to have anal sex, saying straight anal sex was better than same-sex anal sex. Say that five times. Texas is hardly alone in concluding that homosexual sodomy may have severe physical, emotional, psychological, and spiritual consequences, which do not necessarily attend heterosexual sodomy, and from which Texas citizens need to be protected, he wrote. So not only does he misunderstand the Constitution because the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment clearly designates equal rights to LGBT couples, but clearly there's something that he's hiding. I mean, to be this vehemently anti-gay, to be this clueless, uh, to really demonize gay people like this, you've got to You've got to be hiding something, right? So let me ask William Pryor this. This isn't you, right, in this picture. I mean, you don't have any skeletons in your closet, right? I'm just curious. Is this your photo? Well, of course, he denies that this is him when he was younger that posed for a gay porn photo shoot. Eh, I think he might be gay. As if we don't already have... 250 examples that we could point to of anti-gay pastors and justices and Republicans that were caught having sex with gay prostitutes, just partying it up. Unbelievable. So look, um, here's the takeaway. If Donald Trump appoints Supreme Court justices like this who are going to take away gay people's rights, you're not pro-gay. You're not an LGBT ally. I'm sorry. If he is pro-gay, prove it. Do not appoint a homophobe to the Supreme Court. But even if it's the case that Donald Trump chooses to not appoint a homophobe to the Supreme Court, well, he still states that he clearly wants to appoint someone to the Supreme Court that would overturn Roe v. Wade. So if you are a woman in the country and your state is conservative and wants to prohibit you from having an abortion, you have to travel to another state. In Donald Trump's own words, you can go to another state. Sorry, rape victims, but you uh, have to go to another state to get an abortion because uh, President Trump appointed a Supreme Court justice that overturned your right to uh, have an abortion. That's safe and legal. Well, I've got news for you. Uh, homosexuality, abortion, these are things that will not go away regardless of their legality. They're going to be here forever. You're going to either have to get used to it. You can offer safe and legal abortions to women. You can uh, allow gay people to uh, not get married, but we're going to exist. Abortions will still happen. You can't turn back the clock. And that's the problem with Donald Trump and his supporters and their mindset. They think they can turn back the clock, but you can't. And furthermore, if women actually don't have the right to an abortion, then what are you going to campaign on? You can't scare evangelicals and say, look, if you want to ban abortion, then vote for us, because then what are you going to do? The fight's over. So, look, the conclusion, I kind of went off on a tangent, but Donald Trump is not pro-gay. Donald Trump is a scary president, uh, and his Supreme Court choices will influence the court for three to four decades, and that is a terrifying thought. Well, that's all I got for you guys. I want to thank you all for tuning in. If you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. And I want to give a special thank you to all of the members on humanistreport.com and people who donate through PayPal and the Patreon patrons because you guys are really helping this show not just thrive and survive, but expand. And I've got big things coming uh, that I have in my mind that I'm trying to work out right now for the show. So stay tuned. Uh, again, you guys are phenomenal. Thank you so much for being engaged in politics. Stay progressive. Stay angry. Uh, stay uh, aware of the political situation. And we really can affect change. I'll see you next week. Have a great day.